Today's scripture is from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Lord, we thank you for this time of teaching and open our ears that we might hear and maybe a better understand the truth read to us this morning. From this Ephesians 6, put on the full armor of God, in Jesus' name, amen. So the title of my sermon this morning is Spiritual Warfare 101. You know, I remember as a boy riding on and drawing pictures of what was called a magic slate. Right on it? Lift up the slate upon which you wrote, and presto, everything was gone, erased. Sort of like a magnetic etch a sketch Draw something, shake it all about, and there remains no trace of what you did, it drew. In today's world, we just push the delete button to erase what we had. Once upon a time, I believe that on the day I stand in judgment, God would play this video of all my sins. And for many of us, for sure, that would be a full-length movie. For every sin, I would need to give an answer. And in the presence of a holy God, there would be no adequate answers to be given. Surely then, I would be judged unworthy of heaven. Now, a whole lot of people think the same way. No way can I live up to the expectations of God Almighty. So, why even try? And with that flawed thinking, they surrender to sin, and they pronounce their own death sentence at their death. They might know about God, but because they think themselves to be unworthy, they live a life of sin. They don't understand the fiery darts Satan already has launched against them that have already pierced their heart. All of this thinking that we are unworthy is just one of Satan's lies that he plants in our head. And that's why Ephesians 6 tells us to protect our minds, to protect our thoughts from the wiles of Satan. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Where do we wear a helmet? Well, duh. On our head to protect us not only from physical fall, but from flawed thinking. Even as Esau did when he sold his birthright to his brother Jacob for a bowl of soup. And why did he do that? Because he was starving, flawed thinking, he was only hungry. So we as Christians must be clear-minded with right thinking. 
What we as Christians forget is that Jesus on the cross paid for not just some of our sins, but every single one of our sins. The blood of Jesus, holy and pure, covers our sins. Like my magic slate lifted up or an edge of sketch shaken all about, what was there is gone. I heard this recently and I think it worthy to remember. Well may the accuser roar of sins that I have done. I know them well and a thousand more. My God, he knoweth none. Jesus said it in Matthew 26 as he celebrated the Lord's Supper. Hear the words of the Lord. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Jesus said, shed his blood on Calvary's cross as a new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. Not only does the blood of Jesus remove the stain of sin, but God does one thing more. He forgets our sin. He removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. God forgives perfectly and completely. For the believer, in his eyes, our sins are no more. The forgiveness of sins is a foundational building block for us as Christians. Forgiveness comes through the sure and certain foundation of Jesus Christ the Lord. So no matter how far we might have wandered or might have strayed away from God, Jesus offers the way back. The invitation is always, always open, even when you think your sins are too many, maybe too egregious. Here's a key verse to remember when you think yourself to be unworthy. Jesus says that in Matthew 12, and so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven. But blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Blasphemy is to deny the Holy Spirit. Every other kind of sin is forgivable through repentance and belief in Jesus. When Jesus says in Matthew 11, 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. He really means it. Whatever you sin, come and give it over to Him. Instead of you bearing the load of sin, as Jesus goes on to say in that verse, ye shall find rest for your souls. Give your sins to the Lord, and He will give you peace and rest. My magic slate and etch a sketch memories are but a reminder that God erases our sins. They remind us that there is a way back through Jesus and His atoning sacrifice. Knowing that, let's continue as we armor up for Satan's attacks. But sometimes Satan offers to us such an appealing sin and we fall and we give in. Even though the Holy Spirit is warning to us, danger, danger, we put him on mute and satisfy our fleshly desires so we open the door. And like open the door to your house, Satan enters in with his horde of demons and minions. And like modern day warfare, a swarm attacks, hoping that one gets through. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian. The enemy attacks us all, always at our greatest point of weakness, at our Achilles heel, if you will. Oh, the deed is done, the sin has happened. And we've already talked about the road back to purity, the, back, the road back to forgiveness. But how do we resist? How do we stand firm against the temptations that Satan puts before us? How do we not fall into sin and maintain, keep intact our spiritual cleanliness? How do we maintain our purity? Welcome to a term 
many have not heard, and some who have heard it don't understand it. What I'm talking about is spiritual warfare. Since the Garden of Eden, there has been this cosmic battle for the souls of men. Good versus evil, right against wrong, God against Satan. And in the balance of that battle, the tug of war is spiritual battle for not just the souls of men, but to make it very, very personal. There's a tug of war for your soul as well. Once upon a time, I poo-pooed this idea of spiritual warfare. But like so much flawed thinking of the past, my eyes have been opened. All my life, with my without me even understanding it, there's been this battle for my soul. In the darkness, thundering hooves come to carry me away. In the light, the peace and tranquility of a meadow at sunrise. Even today, I have a keen sense of when evil lurks nearby. I'm not immune to the wiles and strategies of Satan. All of us are targets in his sight. And if you don't think you can fall in battle, look at David. And what did God say to David in Acts 13? God testified concerning him, that would be David. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. And even with that high accolade, commendation from God the Father, yet God, yet David falls into sin with Bathsheba. So if you think to yourself, it won't happen to me, be on guard. For us not only to persevere through spiritual warfare, but to stand firm, we need to put on the armor of God. Ephesians 6.10 says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now, Ephesians 6 uses a Roman soldier in his uniform to explain the armor of God. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, feet fitted with gospel good news, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. All of this spiritual armor is used in a war that has already been won. One day, Napoleon gathered his lieutenants spread, and he spread a map on the table and said, Sirs, if it weren't for this red spot, I could conquer the world. And the red spot to which he pointed was the British Isles, the very nation that defeated Napoleon in the Battle of Waterloo. And so it is with Satan as he gathers his minions about today, hoping to conquer the world, and he says to them, if it weren't for this red spot, I could conquer the world. And where is that red spot to which Satan points? Well, it's Calvary's Hill where Jesus' blood was shed. People, the war is already won. We may stumble in battle, but we are not casualties of the war. We are victors with Jesus if He's the captain of our souls. So let me give you some arrows for your quiver. I'm not going to explain the meaning of God's armor that Paul recites for us in Ephesians 6. That would be a good home study for each one of you. What I'm about to give you is some practical, pragmatic ways to help you in your own spirit war against the devil. And the first is, the Lord rebuke you from Jude verse 9. Words spoken by the mighty archangel Michael to Satan. The first, the full verse goes like this. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to condemn him for slander, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Now don't get hung up on the dispute over Moses' body. Realize that Michael dared not accuse or argue with Satan, but merely said, 
the Lord rebuke you. When faced with temptation, don't argue with Satan. I'm here to tell you, he knows more scripture than you do. You are going to lose if you argue with Satan. The first arrow in your quiver for spiritual warfare is this. The Lord rebuke you. Repeat after me. The Lord rebuke you. Here's the second arrow. Run. What did Joseph do when Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him? The Bible says, but he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. Now your feet can march you into trouble, or you can use your feet to run from sin, to run from temptation. Just move. Don't just stand there. Again, the second arrow for your spiritual warfare quiver, quiver is run. R U N. Arrow number three. Use your head. Use your noggin, people. I know I said I wasn't going to explain God's armor depicted in Ephesians 6, but you need to use your head. The Bible says, take the helmet of salvation in verse 17 of Ephesians 6. Earlier I said that Satan knows your weakest, most vulnerable sin to which you are most likely to give in. Here's the secret. You do too. Primary battlefield in spiritual warfare is the Christian's mind. Quite simply, use your head. In any battle, you need to know your enemy. The devil doesn't play fair. Even Jesus said Satan is a murderer and the father of lies in John chapter 8. And know that you can't outsmart him, know that you can't outwit him, and you can't outfight him. All you need to know is this. It comes from James 4, verse 7. And we read, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Know that at the name of Jesus, Satan flees. Know your enemy. One more arrow for your quiver. Ephesians 6.18 is that arrow. It says, and pray in the Spirit. Pray, pray, and then pray some more. When the armies of Israel relied on their own strength, they lost. When they cast themselves upon God's mercy, victory followed. You too can gain the high ground, the victory, if you don't rely on yourself, but you rely on God. Pray. Pray and pray. There you have it. Not an all-inclusive list of arrows for your quiver, but some practical first response arrows when the battle comes to your front door. And again, they are. The Lord rebuke you. Run. Use your head. Pray. There are a thousand other arrows you can find in the Bible. But above all, know that the Lord goes before you. Thus saith the Lord unto you. Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. In other words, in spiritual warfare, don't you be leading the charge. Let God take the lead. The battle is not yours, 